Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We're super excited to have our guest, Ben Joya, on. He is the author of Influence with a Heart. We have so much to talk about. This is a topic that we've never really had on more than 1,000 shows, Ben, and that is maybe you have a book in there. Maybe it's time for your organization to write a book. And we talk about storytelling all the time but we never put it into the context of an actual book, right? It's going to be interesting to hear what you have to say. So stay tuned because this is going to be a lot of fun. Another thing that's super fun and we're really excited about is our new cohort of co-hosts. Say that fast three times. We have pan a panel from all over the U.S., super interesting and diverse folks that work in all sectors of the nonprofit world. And um, we've been rolling them out and you've been able to meet them. And uh, so we're really excited to share that with everyone. Another thing that's really important to us are, are our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. Okay, Ben Joya. The sexiest man alive when you tell everyone where you're coming to us from. Uh, Valencia, Spain. Oh, you're living the dream. Yeah, thank you. I just got here. Uh, May 6th will be five months. Wow. Yeah. And and so you're, you're working remotely. Yeah. I got to ask this question as a person that works with words and writing. Has this changed your vocabulary or the way you express yourself I mean changing a country or is it too yeah it, it definitely has um and I think the biggest thing that I'm noticing at least at this point is that I thought I was a pretty mellow person when I lived in the United States right I'm from New York lived in California for a while and when I lived in New York where I was born people would ask me are you from California because compared to everybody else, I was super mellow. I got to Spain and it was like, wow, I have to downshift about two more years. And it's been really neat in terms of you know, me being thoughtful about my writing, about my work, mm -hmm. you know, that I am intentionally spending more time just kind of thinking about it and not looking too closely at it and then taking a walk on the beach and really allowing things to arise rather than pushing them forward. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Do you have an extra bedroom in your apartment? I, I do to, actually. <laughs> I need yeah. to show up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it. I think travel is a remarkable thing. And I think in the nonprofit sector, it's even more remarkable because we have a sector that is so different from cultures around the world. I know that we get asked at, at the American Nonprofit Academy, a lot of questions from foreign uh, organizations like how do you do this how does it work because we structurally are different right I mean you know legislatively we are a different sector like if you own a restaurant in China and South America and say Canada they're going to be some similarities right on how things work but that nonprofit NGO concept <laughs> doesn't exist in many places in the world right mm -hmm. So it's such an interesting thing for you to be able to be writing and, and experiencing that journey in a different place. I give you um, really a lot of kudos and, and it's super fun to hear this. Yeah. Thank you. Really. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really, really grateful to be here and don't take any of it for granted. Well, before we go on, talk to us about Influence with a Heart and what does that look like and what is this methodology that you've created? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, Influence with the Heart just came out of my, really out of my intention to serve. Um, I had a, shall I say, funny experience when I spent several months in India and I faced death four times in like 72 hours and came out of that experience with an absolutely galvanized desire to serve and came back to the US and figured out how to, took a few years, but figured out how to really leverage what I was good at and bring it into the world. And I started with a marketing focus, you know, called it marketing with a heart. 
and then realized that uh, I didn't want to just be the marketing guy and thought about the word influence and all the applications of influence in communication and leadership in a great many things. So for me, influence with a heart is, is basically the, the ongoing invitation um, to, to invite or to offer someone to say yes to you, whether it's opening up your email, taking you up on your offer, partnering you, with you, collaborating you th- with you, whatever the case may be. And the idea of business being able to you know, be a powerful force for change, whether it's for-profit or non-profit. And you know, all of those things together made me realize, hey, uh, let's let me throw my hat in the ring, no pun intended, <laughs> for, uh, <laughs> for how, how can we help make business better for everyone, for the, for the business itself, for the people that they're serving, and by extension, for everyone else in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so interesting to, to, to hear about your journey because we hear this a lot with the nonprofit sector, particularly founders. It's something that a lot of times is just like pick them up by the scruff of the neck, shaking them, and then they have an epiphany and they, they pivot their life and their mission, their personal mission and their community mission. And so um, I think that's a good story, right? Um, and so I guess that kind of leads me to this this next thing and that you know starting off with can a book tell that story can that can a book share that or is that something that we need to really be doing more on a personal level like because if you have a different experience as a reader to something to the spoken word right yep yep yeah so Thank you for asking. I think there's a lot of layers to that question. There are. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I just, just want to thoughtfully acknowledge that. Um, but you know, so, so I think the central part of this, um, Julia, right, is is around sharing the story, mm-hmm. right? That's the most important part of this, regardless of the medium, right? Because you know we've been sharing stories for almost as long as we've been in existence, right? So before the cave paintings, we're around a fire sharing stories with each other, right? We're meaning making individuals. It's really important to do, do, do stories, share stories for all the reasons. And, you know, some people read, some people listen, some people listen to podcasts, right? So there are definitely different ways of, of receiving those stories, but there's something about a book, right? Which is so powerful and so powerful for, a significant part of human history, right? Um, you know, if we start with the the Bible and the Quran and, you know, all these, you know, these books from back in the day, shall I say. And there's that also that funny energy of, uh, you, know, you say you wrote a book or you're writing a book and somebody's like, oh my God, you're writing a book? Mm-hmm. You know, you must know something. Yeah. <laughs> you must it's, be an expert in that thing. It's very impressive. Yeah. It's very impressive. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's funny because not that I would recommend this, but I know the story of a woman who wrote a book, uh, which was like the complete guide to everything that men know about women. And the book is completely blank. And she made like a million bucks from that book. (laughs) Now, again, I'm not espousing the blank book here, but it just goes to show you that there is a power in just the book and, you know, all of the things that can happen. And something that I teach my clients, which came out of my own experience and how I develop my business, you know, is this idea of leveraging the book before it's published, sometimes even before it's written, to make an impact. Right? Okay. There's so much possibility in doing that. So Ben, when you when you say that, um, it makes me think that it's not just that physical book. It is like the journey, it's the process which is also changing because of self-publishing and digital publishing and, you know, all of these things, just the, the way that the publish book publishing has changed in less than 15 years is, is really dramatic. Yeah. Um, it had been pretty much the same for a long time. And now I, I feel like it's a lot more accessible. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. We have so many beautiful opportunities, right. Um, that we don't have to rely on traditional publishers that self-publishing is a beautiful route to go. Uh, let me footnote that with 
professional self-publishing, right? Do not self-publish your own book because it's not the highest and best use of your time and you'll make a ton of mistakes. And then, you know, then you're kind of at zero, right? But self-publishing opens up the door in so many ways to all of us in ways that we couldn't even imagine. You know, the costs are far less. We have total control rather than giving up our intellectual property. Right. And I could go on and on and on with all of the benefits of self-publishing. <laughs> I love it. Well, let's yeah. talk about that because you use the word professional. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are intimidated by the thought of, oh yeah, I can meet somebody and tell them the story, but I don't know if I could write it down or I don't know if I could tell it, you know, for a book format. I mean, all of that. Do we need to be able to do this ourselves or how do we partner or collaborate and still be uh, authentic and, and true to what we want to communicate? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So there are a few different ways to get to the goal. Um, so you can work with a ghostwriter. Uh, that can be beneficial in some ways, um, but you want to make sure that that person can really get your voice into the book, and that can be tricky. Uh, also, ghostwriting is quite an investment most of the time, you know, $50,000, $100,000, depending on who the provider is. And, and there are certainly lower cost versions of that, but you want somebody who's really going to take the time. Like you want somebody who's going to put in a thousand hours to your book. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, because it's, it's really, really important. So for me, uh, the folks that I end up working with, they all seem to want to write the book themselves. It's really important for them to tell their story, share their message, you know, be able to bring that book forth. And it's not only for the, the story, and the message, but it's because they know, because I tell them, <laughs> they know that they can turn their book into all sorts of other content. So, you know, if you've ever seen a champagne glass pyramid at like a wedding mm -hmm. or a video of that, you know, you fill up all of the champagne glasses by pouring the champagne into that top glass and it trickles down. I like to use that analogy for books, right? Your book is that top glass, and then you can turn your book into all sorts of things. Uh, sometimes instantaneously and sometimes, you know, with a little tweaking of the dials, so to speak. Um, so to continue the thought of, you know, telling the story and, and you know, making sure you're honoring that story, to me, it comes down to one's authentic voice, right? We want to share our voice, whether it's through what we're speaking on a podcast, on a webinar, and certainly in the pages of our book. And then a lot of times people get hung up on, oh, I'm not a good writer and I don't know what to say. And then there's all sorts of, you know, fear and shame and doubt and judgment and all the stuff and the monkey mind and, you know, the, the, the various and sundry list of things that can stop people, right? And I say to dictate as much of your book as possible, right? And that does not mean just speak extemporaneously because that's not going to get you anywhere, <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if you work with, like what I do with my clients is I give them a book blueprint and then we kind of bullet point out section by section the talking points in a good communication framework. And then I'll have them dictate for seven minutes at a time because in seven minutes you can speak 1,200 words and 1,200 words is 5% of a 25,000 word book. Wow, that blows my mind. And I love that concept because in the nonprofit world, you know, we are used to witnessing with our voice, using that storytelling um, connection to donors and funders and policymakers. You know, we use the word storytelling all the time, all the time, all the time. So mm -hmm. I love this. A really interesting question has just come in, Ben, and I've got to ask this. One of our viewers writes, how does AI play into storytelling when working with donors and funders in this format? Very interesting. Yeah, that, that's a great question. There's a great many la layers to that as well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as you can imagine, because AI is a, you know, certainly a complex topic. Um, so for me and you know, what I tell my authors is AI is a fabulous tool that you can use to support your writing, that you can use to support your research, 
that kind of stuff. But don't try to write a book with AI yeah. because it's going to sound like crap and it's not going to be in your own voice. Yeah, I agree. Right? So there's a really, really important distinction in there. So you can you can improve on your writing sometimes. You can flesh out some ideas. You know, if you speak extempor or not extemporaneously, if you speak and dictate and then need to organize some of what you've you know, gotten down. AI can be helpful for that. Um, I know that there are some people who just can't quite organize, like they don't want to sit down and organize their thoughts. So here's a great tool that can help kind of put things in order or make headlines, things like that. That's a great use of it as a tool. But so many people think, oh, I can just get AI to do, you know, do my book for me. And it ends up being, you know, an ugly mess, basically. Um, and I know I have a strong opinion about this, but it's just it, it it's it's dead prose in my experience. Even if even though the the robot is smart, you know, in doing what it can do, because it is amazing, it's not going to capture your story, your passion, your intention in the way that you want to bring it forth. So, you know, use it sparingly, use it discerningly, and don't use it at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're you're spot on for and I, you know I'm a writer at heart so I guess for me I want to write I want to be able to do that and then you know I, I like what you said about the organizational aspect it's all about the prompts as we all know with AI how do you you prompt that inquiry so that it's going to help serve serve your project as opposed to to lead the project I kind of move on a little bit here and talk about milestone marketing books. Mm -hmm. um, so many of our nonprofits, they they reach a really important date in their service, maybe a 75th anniversary or a 100 year anniversary or 150, 200, whatever. And, and milestone marketing is such a huge piece of this. Writing books, commemorating people that have long gone. Um, how good of an idea is this? I mean, what is the shelf life of that? I mean, is that going to be something that we only use during that milestone marketing event or can that live on with the organization? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I think milestone marketing is a brilliant concept, um, especially for nonprofits, right? For mm -hmm. the reasons that you just gave a bit of voice to. Um, for me, it's, you know, someone or several people came up with a vision and put it into practice and turned it into something that's serving humanity or animals or the planet, however you want to say that, um, that's incredible. And sometimes in the day-to-day, -day, I mean, I worked for a nonprofit for quite a few years for the ALS Association, Lou Gehrig's disease, and it was really easy to get lost kind of in the shuffle of the work and, you know, really easy for the donors in just from my lens you know, just to hear again, like, hey, you know, help us out, help us out. <laughs> right, right. But, right. But if, but a, a milestone marketing book, right, being able to tell the story in that context really gets everybody on the same page. Again, no pun intended, right? Because there's that whole emotional connection. There's the whole uh, generation of an empathetic experience through storytelling, which is incredibly powerful. And I don't think if constructed, thoughtfully and strategically, it can have pretty much an infinite shelf life, okay. right? Um, you know, you might at some point tweak the cover to not say, you know, 100th celebration right on the cover, yes. you know, if, it, if it's a couple years later. Um, but as long as you're not changing the, the title or the subtitle, you can tweak the the dial, if you will, on the cover and not even have to change the ISBN, nothing like that. And it's fine if in you know, the pages of the book, you're comm commemorating, you know, as of, you know, the year 2024, we're celebrating 100 years. Yeah. And, you know, we're looking to celebrate 100 more, right? So you can language it in a way that this is a, you know, a touchstone that's really, really important. And, that it's also really important to celebrate success. Um, I, I think as Americans, <laughs> uh, maybe North Americans, but at least as Americans, you know, there's the, the go, go, do, do. And it's like, well, you know, when do we actually stop and go hooray and really honor ourselves and each other for the amazing work we're doing? 
Yeah, I like that. I also think too, it's a changing story, like what an organization starts with, um, because what they identified as a problem is is oftentimes, you know, we move forward. I mean, society moves forward, things change, um, you know, uh, just policies change, things that women could do to serve, you know, it was not possible. Now it is. I mean, children's issues change from then to now. I mean, there's a lot of history, I think, layered in with how we tell our stories. And I think it can be really meaningful. Um, and I also think it is a good tool to learn about an organization to build support. Mm -hmm. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a, there's a big difference in my experience from, you know, knowing what a great organization does to actually reading a story, hearing a story about a particular person that was served or a dog that was saved or whatever that is, because that's the stuff that sticks out, right? We're, you know, that whole left brain, right brain harmony, our left brains want the facts and the information and our right brain wants the story. And if you lean too much in one direction or another, um, like you may have had this experience. I know I have, you know, I'll go to uh, I'll go to a talk, I'll hear a talk and it's super inspirational and you come out and it's like, okay, that was great, but I don't know what to do now. Right. Or the, the inverse of, oh, I got all this great information, but you know, my brain is dead and I never want to hear that again. Mm -hmm. Right. An overload. Yeah, exactly. I, I agree. I agree. Well, let's get on to the meat and potatoes of the whole thing. I mean, you've convinced us that this is the good thing to do and the right thing to do. But what's the reality? Costs and, and, and time, because this isn't just like a weekend project. I mean, this is going to involve time and and time has its own costs. Help kind of give us some ideas on what we should be thinking about. Yeah, thank you. So uh, <laughs> there's a lot of answers to this one as well. Um, and the first answer is really to make sure that you're working with, collaborating with a really good coach and a really good publisher, right? Okay. Because like any industry, there are dicey people out there. And there are also people who, I like the analogy of, uh, they will offer you one slice of pizza and they'll say, no, this is the whole pie. This is all you need. Really, this will fill you up. <laughs> and it's like, no, that's not the case, right? Like a book by itself, most of the time, doesn't do all of what you want it strategic, uh, to strategically do, right? There's more involved in the book, the relationships, the marketing, if that's appropriate. So, you know, understand who you're collaborating with and the intention of the book. And then from there, um, I'll just give a quick example. Like, so for me, what I do with my authors is I will have them have conversations with their ideal clients and partners to understand the lens of the book, right? To understand what to, what to include, what not to include, what stories to focus on, the language to include. And then that optimizes the process of the book creation, right? So you're not trying to fit, like take guesses of what should I put in there? You know, you from the horse's mouth, you put in what they say, <laughs> right? Serve your audience in, in, a, in a powerful and profound way. And then if you follow a method or follow a blueprint like I do with my folks and you're doing some amount of dictating at least, you can have a messy first draft, I like to call it, done in you know five to 13 weeks. Right? Interesting. Okay, good. That yeah. is really helpful. I mean, because that's that's fascinating. I, I didn't think you would say that. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And and you know, I, I have several clients who've done it that quickly have some who it's taken a few months. Um, you know, it's fine either way, <laughs> right? Because sometimes the things take longer because things happen in business or life or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But just to know that, you know, there are optimized processes out there. And, you know, when we, uh, you, know, you bake a cake, you follow the recipe, it comes out well, <laughs> right? You screw with the recipe, then, eh, you know, you're, you're getting a little dicey. Um, so, you can get a, a manuscript done that quickly. You know, the editing, again, depending on, you know, the, the, the shape of the book, if you will, the shape of the manuscript, upon, you know, into the kind of the deeper editing process. So two-ish months, 
Mm -hmm. right? Um, and of course there can be variations on there. So for me, you know, I want for my authors, things to be super dialed in through the whole process, like follow the method, do the things, do the things. So when we get to the editing, there's not that much editing to do. <laughs> Right, right. So, you know, do, do it right back here and you keep doing it right. And then when we move into the publishing, uh, you know, actually submitting a final manuscript to the publisher. And again, this, you know, professional self-publishing, like I talked about before, um, you know, which would be like things like the, the finer detailed proofreading and the cover design and the keyword research and the category research, the, you know, getting it ready for distribution, the different kinds of formats. All of that stuff, the way we do it is we look at a at a 90 day window, three months, right? Because most of the time for the author at that point is the back and forth with the proofreaders, you know, making sure all of that stuff is right. Mm -hmm. But then another aspect, and again, you know, thinking, thinking whole pizza, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking strategically about the whole thing is, <laughs> you know what I want my folks to think of in terms of their book is how do you strategically use the book, right? How do you leverage the book before it's published? So, you know, get the cover designed, put it up and be like, Hey, this book is coming. I mean, I, I got a, I got a 10 month consulting gig with a fortune 100 company from doing exactly that. Mm -hmm. I hadn't finished my book. I put it up. Somebody was like, Hey, we want to talk to you about doing this thing. I was like, great. <laughs> right. Yeah. So getting the cover up there, doing pre-sales, right, is another opportunity for marketing and awareness. And then releasing the book, you know, getting it up for sale, what some people will call a soft launch, right, that in and of itself, hooray, the book is out there. And then waiting a couple of months, a few months to then do a bestseller launch, Mm -hmm. Right. So a lot of times people will do the bestseller launch and the release right at the same time. And they're missing a big opportunity because kind of what we were talking about before, you know, you get the book up and available for sale, you know, celebrate. You just published a freaking book. Yeah. <laughs> right. T take a rest and then use those subsequent months leading up to the bestseller launch to develop relationships, to get onto podcasts, to send hardcover copies of your book to ideal clients and strategic partners and, you know, donors and all these kinds of people. Cause imagine how cool it is if somebody gets a hardcover version of your book. Yeah. Right. And I then do the bestseller launch. <laughs> yeah, I love it. You know, I think um, what I've so enjoyed um, Ben hearing from you and learning from you is that you've really painted a picture of a journey and it's, I think a lot of times we think about writing, it's like that physical book, when I just hold it in my hand type of thing. And that's not really the way to think about it is what I've, I've learned from you is it's that journey and how are we going to use that as a tool? Um, and it's not a one and done thing, that it, it has some opportunities that we might not even realize. Um, ben Joya, Influence with a Heart, really been fun to talk with you and to learn from you. Um, one of our previous guests, uh, Carl Cox, Carl J. Cox, um, uh, came on the show. You know, it's been a while, and he'd written this great book, um, which I have sent to um, a, a lot of different folks. It's all about CEO leadership and navigating that journey. And um, it's, I know he worked with you, and um, he he's he said to me. Um, on a phone call one day, he's like, this is because I said, this has been such a great tool. And he said, well, I really had great support. And I had a lot of the information in my head. But I needed that that person with the expertise in, in publishing to help guide me so I could tell my story. And, uh, and so that's how we came to you. I don't even know if you knew that, um, if I'd shared that with you before. But uh, yeah, so, really. Yeah. No, thank you. I, I love how these things happen in, in this uh, small, big world of ours, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That's a great way to put it. That really, really is. Well, yeah. um, Ben Joya, Influence with a Heart. Check yeah. out influencewithaheart.com. You can learn more about Ben, his journey, um, learn about his methodology, what he does. And we have just scratched the surface, but I think it's been really great. I've learned a lot today, Ben. Um, and, and I really know that so many 
folks in the nonprofit sector are going to be able to look at some of these opportunities in a different way for their organization. So thank you. Thank you for that. It's been a lot of fun. Um, Again, we have amazing sponsors and I want to make sure that we give them a shout out. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and JMT Consulting. I'm going to be in Boston later in the week talking uh, with the folks at JMT Consulting at a conference that they're having. We will be broadcasting live from that conference on Thursday. So check us out. We'll also be on the other side of the country broadcasting live from Cultivate um, 2024, which is will be held in, uh, in San Diego, sponsored by our friends at Fundraising Academy at National University. So we're on the road this week, my friend. Thanks. Not like you. You're like really in the road road, but you know. <laughs> Coming to us from Valencia, Spain, Ben Goya. It has been a delight learning from you. And you. Uh, I know we'll have more questions for you and we'll get you back on another episode of the Nonprofit Show. It sounds great. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, as we end our, our episode today, we leave with a message we leave with this message every day, but like I always say, it, it means different things. And the message is this, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here next time.